Yeah, sure. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Okay. Everyone knows my name, Julius Donko. Um, so today we're going to be looking at troubleshooting some um, noise interference on EGM um, for pacemakers and ICDs. Um, we've, um, what I found really useful was this Boston um, presentation, EDF, uh, PDF, sorry. Um, from the Boston Educare, um, I found it really useful um, when I was studying for my IBHRE. And I thought, um, just like um, AJ was saying in introduction um, in earlier, that um, it's a universal thing, having noise interference um, um, for uh, noise interference on EGM is something that everybody will come across um, in, in their pacing clinic rooms. So it is important to be able to know um, how the device actually um, discriminates um, noise for, you know, for ICDs, those with ICDs, um, and um, prevent inappropriate therapy. Um, or if somebody's pacemaker dependent, for instance, and um, the device has got like um, an algorithm that switches to maybe noise reversion uh, to prevent um, cardiac output. Um, um, you know, season and going, you know, um, to 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 reduce cardiac output so that they, um, they, they will basically go into hemodynamic collapse. So um, so noise re reversion prevents that from happening. Um, so we're going to be going over 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 this. Um, I've just picked a few examples, and I'm pretty sure um, Jared and AJ will be able to jump in, or anyone else to jump in because I, I issued the, the presentation out earlier in the week so that people will have a chance to um, go over it and and we can just basically talk about it so I've not I'm not going to go through the sensing and the sensing circuit you know device pacing and sensing circuit this is something that you can do in your own time and um, so just if you have any questions you can reach out to either myself AJ or Jared and we're more than happy to talk about it. So I thought we would basically go over noise. Um, so noise comes in different forms for devices. So you can get physiological interference, um, basically, which we all come across um, far-filled um, noise. So for instance, your right ventricular lead um, will be seen, if you have a dual chamber system, will be seen by the atrial lead. Um, so that, that's far field, that's interference on it. And usually devices have um, ways of um, ignoring that, um, even if they see it. So for instance, Medtronic will have partial plus, um, or you can even um, decrease um, the atrial sensitivity and so forth. Um, skeletal muscle signals as well um, is one that can come across from a physiological point of view. Um, then you've got electrical um, noise, um, which obviously non-physiological ones. So you can get lead fractures, for instance, or during implant um, or post implant when the lead goes in the terminal pin port, it's not really screwed in properly. That that can that can create noise as well um, on the EGM, um, or for instance, an abandoned lead, um, abandoned lead in, in the chamber can cause, can touch another lead that can also create noise. So there's so many different ways. And the last, the last is your EMI, electromagnetic interference. Um, so that comes in, there are different types of that. You've got noise that radiates, you've got static noise, static sort of mag magnetic field or, or um, radiated magnetic field. Um, for instance, one that you get from like your um, electric power pole, um, this would be quite relevant for, for Africa um, and um, people who live on farms, for instance. Um, so that, that's quite relevant. Or you can get um, static magnets, which you find in your normal consumer products and, and things like that. So all of these things create um, electromagnetic interference. People are more likely to come across um, MRIs as well. And a lot of device um, patients with devices often go for MRI scanning. So it is important to know um, what to do when these patients come into your clinic and are referred for an MRI scanning. 
the other PDF, which I um, I sent out to the group, which shows the Medtronic guidelines for um, giving warnings and precautions on on EMIs, is actually really really useful to have um, either either on your desktop or a printed form in your clinic because you will definitely come across patients who might come across either at home um, some um, consumer product that you're using um, or, or maybe in their workplaces and, and or are going to the dentist, for instance, they will, they will be asking you questions. Um, can we use this? Can, is this okay? Is it safe for me to use? So always refer to that. I've always found it really useful because there's it's, it's a lot of information there that you, you can't remember. Um, so have this on hand so that you can always refer to it in the future. Um, but if you've got any questions in the future, you can always refer, you can always ask um, myself, Jared, um, or EG. Uh, I like this Boston Educare um, um, presentation because at the end of this, it, it does actually really sum summarize it really well. Whenever you see an interference, to consider when did it happen? Did it happen um, post implant, immediately post implant? Or is it maybe a year later? And it gives you examples of it tries to localize what the sources of the fault is. And um, so it's, it's really, really good to always refer to this. As I said, this was really useful for me when I was doing my IBHRE. So people like Elvis in the future, you will find this very, very useful. So we give thanks to Boston as well for making this available um, for us to use. Really quick, uh, one thing yeah. I'd like to, to add there, um, as Julius pointed out, you know, noise can be very impactful with devices and you may ask, you know, why does this matter? Well, in pacemakers, noise, any kind of electrical interference can be interpreted as an intrinsic cardiac activity. Um, so in a pacemaker that could lead the device to withhold pacing, thinking that something is going on in the heart. And during that time, if a patient is dependent, they're without any kind of pacing support, um, which can be very dangerous, it can be life-threatening, um, and it, it depends on the kind of circumstance and the kind of noise. Uh, in defibrillators, same thing, it can cause pacemaker inhibition on the defibrillator itself. It can also cause the defibrillator portion or the tachytherapy portion to misinterpret um, what could be nothing to be a, a VF and the patient could receive multiple shocks. Um, so there's been issues with uh, leads who've deteriorated over time and patients have received 20, 30 shocks for something that uh, they shouldn't have, um, which can be not only physically traumatic, but mentally traumatic as well. So these are the things you need to look out for when you're following up with your patients. Um, you know, what, what could be causing the noise? Is it something that is, uh, you know, avoidable? Can they, is it an uninsulated, you know, power cord? Is it some, so, something like they do a lot of welding, arc welding? Can they stop doing that? Um, the, these are ways we can help our patient and make sure they have the, the most safe experience possible. So back to you, Julius. Excellent. Thanks, AJ. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Um, so you can see here causes for noise. Um, and I, it's a great diagram because it's got location in the patient system. So as we spoke about early, earlier, physiological noise. Um, so one example is your insulation break that can cause noise. Um, anything that affects the lead integrity. So that, that's your conductor fracture as well. Um, and then you can get things like uh, micro displacement, lead dislodgement, dislodging, dislodgement, um, post implant. That's one to watch out for, um, which can be micro or overt um, dislodgement. Um, loose set screw, um, again, that can um, create noise as well. Sometimes loose set screw can have air in there that can also, um, and oh, um, later on, we can see on the EGM, um, if we're not able to go through this, by the way, you should do this in your own time. But later on, you can see there are particular patterns, um, even with um, what air trapped in, 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 in the uh, pacing um, and, 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 this, and the loose set screw, so screwed and air trapped in, it can cause a particular pattern on the EGM. Um, and that. so these are things, all things to watch out for. So let's go to the next screen. Um, this is exactly the, we'll go over this again at the end. Um, it, it tells you that hours to days. So if there are issues, what to watch out for leads reversed in the header block, um, loose set screw, 
watch out for that interference. Um, it's got dislodgements as well, whether that is micro displacement or overt displacement. It's a days to week from hours to days to week. And then from months to years, you're, you're looking at um, insulation or lead fracture. So these are all the physiological noises that um, um, you can get with um, creating lead noise on your EGM. So we're not going to, you've got some in, you know, exhaustive like EGMs here. We're not going to be able to go through all the different potential sources of noise. Um, so you can see what a set screw the plug is. This is what um, it looks like. And if it's not, you can see some spaces there. There shouldn't be, and there shouldn't be spaces in a seal plug that potentially could draw in fluid or air into the system. And as you can see, you can see a, a good example um, here, um, seal plug leaking. And you can see like a small, um, you can see that um, Boston I've written down there, a small amplitude noise on the shock channel um, um, with noise on the RE channel. So um, you've got your atrial channel and you've got your ventricular channel in the middle. Um, I wish, can you, can you see my pointer there? Yeah. So Yes, we can. Oh, thanks. Thanks, AJ. So you've got your atrial channel there with a the noise, um, small amplitude noise, um, high frequency noise. And then you've got your ventricular channel there um, and then the short channel. So um, so this is the far field channel here. And the noise is happening simultaneously with on the atrial channel. It's happening simultaneously with the um, shock coil channel. Or far field channel. So there's something happening within the connection um, between the atrial connection, um, atrial lead, atrial EGM, and the short channel, but short, uh, short channel, but um, not on the RV EGM. So it's making you think that maybe the far field, there's a connection between the atrial and the can, but and there's no connection between. Um, there's a there's no connection between so the RV RV channel that's the near field, and and the atrial channel probably might they've not said it here, um could, probably could be a unipolar one connected to the can, which which the far field is, so you can see that there's a seal plug leaking to it, so um so this sort of noise is reproducible re reproducible with an arm movement. And you, you should be able to get it on, on your EGM there. Incidentally, you should be able to also get this on your on 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 the unipolar on your RA channel. If the if the RA is is connected, the, the configuration is from from tip to um can, which is unipolar. Um, if you move your arm like that, it's also very vulnerable um to, to noise. You can see that on the EGM, which is short the shock channel or the far field um, also normally is connected to that on, on, on the unipolar, so um, which is always good. It's almost like your surface ECG. Um, so this example here is a seal, seal plug leaking. Um, so you can see a small amplitude noise on the shock channel coinciding with the RE channel. And you can normally do your arm movement, which um, is reproducible. So that suggests like a unipolar connection there as well. Um, but there's a seal plug leaking. It's that connection is not really, um, there's a plug is leaking. It's not really, there's a, there's a, um, there's an air in there. So you, you gain the noise, not on the bipolar channel, but you get on the unipolar channel on that. Um, yeah, you can also, as it says, you can also get this on an insulation damage um, near the can. Um, so that that's that's a good example to go with. And it's got loads of examples of seal plug leaking. This is quite it's quite difficult actually to try and isolate it as a seal plug because it it does overlap with a lot of things, a lot of potential things that can go wrong. Um, so we can see a good example there. One thing. Um... Julius, you mentioned too, is um, insulation near the can. So uh, what you can see a lot of times, especially if you have a lot of lead, excess lead in the pocket, is you can have lead to lead abrasion where the leads wear on each other or wear against the can over time. 
Uh, some cans have a special uh, seal on the back of it to kind of reduce the risk, a special um, coating to reduce the risk of having this can to lead abrasion, but it still happens. Also things to look out for during gen changes as well. So uh, when you're cutting down to the leads, if you're not careful, you can cause uh, insulation breach as well, which can cause noise. So always be careful with those gen changes. Um, there's opportunities to use suture sleeves or repair kits if need be to repair the lead um, if there is any kind of damage done. Thank you, AJ. Thanks for that. That was really good. Um, so there are numerous examples on the EGM of different types of like noise that you can get. Um, it's a diaphragmatic my potential noise I can see on this EGM here. My there's another one that one so pectoral my potential. Um, so you can clearly see this is a this I, I think I was speaking about this as well. Um, um, to the seal plug leaking so. Pectoral noise. So the atrial lead is is prob probably unipolar um, um, configuration, and the ventricular one is um, bipolar. Um, so as you can see there, the ventricular one is in the middle, and you've got another short coil. So the short coil is always you want to create like a, a surface ECG type, like derived from the um, intrinsic like electrograms. So it's kind of broad compared to your uh, high frequency type EGMs on your atrial and your ventricular um, channel. So this is this is unipolar. Um, so and and it's very susceptible to myopotential um, uh, movement pectoral in in your chest. Um, so um, I get patients come in. Um, so you don't you never ever want to program your atrial lead to um, unipolar for sensing because this is a sort of thing if you can avoid it that is this is a sort of thing that you you will get um so it will be over sensing basically because you get all this noise created and, and device device will sense it over sense it and whenever device over senses that means it won't pace um so over sensing means um pacing inhibition under sensing means it will pace more um, so that's how the devices respond to that. Um, so this is a, a high frequency one, um, which is obviously repeatable as well, uh, pectoral um, manipulation, uh, myopotential on that. So, um, and it, obviously the, um, the presentation goes on to describe in detail, quite technical, the phasic variations and uh, intermittent phasic variations with that. Um, again, this is reproducible with arm movement and um, arm pressing together. Um, we, when I was in Nigeria last August, um, we, 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 we did a, a device clinic with Elvis there and there was a suspicion of lead noise. And we, there are um, uh, isometric maneuvers, which we, we, we did. Um, and if you want, I can um, try and send across or AG or Jara can send across um, to the group chat about all the different, um, and there are so many that you can do, um, all the different types of maneuvering tests, which will help you to be able to diagnose whether there's been, there's a lead fracture, for instance, um, going on, or, or something is going to, going on. So you reproduce the noise. Sometimes it's really, really difficult to tell because um, the lead impedance is fine. Um, everything else looks fine, but the patient maybe might be doing something in, in a particular position, and that causes the lead to maybe the lead um, conductor to the thread, one particular conductor thread to maybe slightly going. Um, so when they do the, that particular posture, that causes that, um, accentuates that or exaggerates that. And, and the impedance might obviously show like an outlier quite high um, and show up as a noise on 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 the EGM, but when they come into clinic, it's really difficult to reproduce things like that. So it's always good to do isometric provocation maneuvers when they come into clinic, and it does help you. Um, and you might need to do on successive occasions in clinic, maybe th every three months you see them if you're highly suspicious of something going on. So it's, it's quite good um, for, to have that to know what to do. Um, and, I, I, oh, sorry. Oh. 
I would say to your point, um, I think also uh, for gen changes, I, I make it a practice to do oh, yeah. ISOs. So I typically do fists together, pull apart, push into me, pull against me. So you're trying to do every kind of vector you can with the arm. Then I do a little pocket manipulation just to see if there's anything at the interface of the device and the header. Um, and we're looking with SenseAmp channels on EGM SenseAmp channels, which are what the device sees for an Abbott device. Um, just because you want to locate these things before you close the patient up and send them on their way. If it turns out they needed a new lead, you have to open them back up and the infection risk goes up considerably. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is fantastic to do it in clinic and then yeah, make sure you're doing it before every gen change, in my opinion. Fantastic, AJ. That's really, really good. So this is doing um, um, provocation maneuvers um, after post um, after box changes. It, to me in the UK, it's not something that we but uh, we tend to I tend to do. Um, but that's a really, really good habit that AJ's pointed out. This is something that I'm going to take on board in my clinic as well to do. Um, I think it really prevents um, you know, if the the, the lead hasn't um, been put in properly, the set screws loose or or things like that, then it will highlight it very quickly so it can get dealt with so that the patient doesn't go away and have to come back introducing risk of infection and various things. And uh, so that's a really good point. Um, something that I'm going to take on board as well, EJ. It's fantastic. So we, we've done a lot of that. So let's go. Um, let's go to another one. We've talked about seal plug and everything there. This is quite an exhaustive this called okay connection issue. Sure. I think it was kind of interesting. It's showing the different kinds of noises. So um you see here, like this is this random, random noise, high amplitude. So that's another way you can kind of diagnose what kind of noise you're seeing. Uh try to take a screenshot of it or a picture of it, um, of the EGM. And you can always reach out to uh to somebody for technical support as well. But that's just ways to kind of diagnose where it's coming from or uh, what kind of noise we're seeing. Sorry, Julius. That's fantastic. Yeah. So there was, um, in fact, I tried, um, I think I'll send it to the group after this, that um, about three or four weeks ago, there was a patient who came in, had a, a single chamber uh, device pacemaker in, and um, and it was basically, it was showing, it was showing a tossade, um, but it was quite difficult to tell. Your initial impression when you see it is that this is noise, but on close inspection, you can see that iron T was um was provoked by um ventricular topic and but it was the you know it was it, it just looked like noise when you initially look at it um so um, AJ is right you know um you can get some high amplitude you get a low amplitude one but you know sometimes you might need to scrutinize it um especially when the noise is also phasic and um repeatable um uh, repeatable as well so so you don't mis misdiagnose it and things so take a picture of it and and you can send it to uh, one of us um and we can um you know help you double check it and things i mean just to add to that as well you've got to when it comes to noise you've really got to have your almost your detective hat on because first you've got to try and determine what the noise is caused by um and as aj said like through this example on the screen now it's quite chaotic there's no real pattern to it so it's probably leading to more a lead issue or a header issue lead noise is always going to be a pattern to it there's going to be high frequency on usually both channels if it's not on both channels then it's very rarely an external noise um, if you're going to get an external noise you're always usually going to see it on both leads you very rarely you see a, a external noise only causing impact on one lead so they're things you've got to think about uh, if it's only on one lead, then you've got to suspect that it's probably an issue with just that lead. If it's on both leads, it may be external noise. Look at your patterns of noise. Um, are they consistent? Is there a pattern to the noise is it on, off, on, off? Like maybe a patient has a, I don't know, a TENS machine that's sending out electrical current every few seconds. So it's on, off, on, off. So you really got to be a little bit detective when it comes to your noise. Um, asking patient questions. Are they getting... Are they getting their symptoms maybe when they're at the gym doing my potentials, doing pec work or push-ups or maybe when they're brushing their teeth or maybe when they're at the physio doing TENS machines or at the dentist? So you really, 
yeah, you've got to be very open-minded, I think, when it comes to uh, the noise as well. Brilliant. Fantastic, Jared. That's absolutely spot on. Yeah, there's a lot of detective work with noise. Um, we, we've had a few patients come in and um, like he, but he sleeps on an electric blanket, you know, um, and he, he sleeps on it for half an hour during the cold winter times, which is a problem we, we don't have in Africa. But he sleeps on an electric blanket and, and he had he had an ICD and, you know, and it had it created a noise on 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 on, on both EGMs. Um, and so we, we, we were trying to work out what, what it is. Sometimes it's quite difficult to pinpoint exactly. And the patient isn't somebody who, um, you know, is quite elderly. You know, when you ask them questions, they, they, they can't really answer. Um, so we, we it, it took a long time asking their carer questions, what they do, what they do, their pattern, the daily pattern and things like that, before you can actually um, sort of pinpoint down to what the issue is. And then we we asked them to switch off, the, um, um, sw switch it off, and basically the, the noise had disappeared. Um, and that, so, um, yeah, things like that. Some people have a warm jacket as well um, yep. to put on. And we've come across that um, in, in the UK. And I didn't know that you can have a jacket that warms it as an electric, like an electric blanket. It's, but it's an electric shirt or, or jacket that you put on that warms you up. Um, and we're thinking, what's that noise? Where's that coming from? And and because you can't work it out, but you have to really in, investigate it to be able to nail it down, nail it down and things. Um and, and I mean, I've always, I've always also been a big fan of getting patients to bring things into the clinic. So if they tell me that they've got a new tens machine or an electric toothbrush or a new electric jumper, and they, and they're worried about it, then I'm my, my first kind of default is right, bring it in, we'll turn it on, and we'll test it. And I think you can't beat that sometimes. Oh, that's 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 a really good idea. I I, I don't do that, but I'll take that on board, Jared. That's a yeah, really, really useful. <laughs> that's really useful, actually. Yeah. Uh, um, so that's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, you can clearly see a connection issue here, um, which was a noise that we 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 saw earlier. Obviously, um, uh, connect. Yeah, this is the noise that we saw earlier on. So you can see on here that the I'm assuming is a ventricular um, terminal pin like um, it's slightly loose. It's not really gone fully in there as the arrow is pointing there. So that's going to create noise on the ventricular EGM. Um, and there's another example um, here as well, um, where you can see the terminal pin hasn't fully gone in and that. So that's another one that could, it, like EG was saying, like box changes um, could clearly um, produce this type of um sources of noise and that so it is good to do maybe some maneuvers um to to try and draw this out potential problem out so you can correct them when you can before in, before introducing some um um um, um, um risks risk of infection later on if you had to come back in so yeah, this is this noise. This noise here is on the RV shock lead. So that that also, like like um, Jared was saying, if you get if there's an electrical source of noise coming, um, interfering with the pacemaker, then you tend to get noise on both channels, on all channels. Um, if there's a an as an ice is a is a noise coming on an isolated um, EGM then that usually indicates maybe there's a fracture or um, a conductor issue. Um, and, and if this one is coming up as a shock lead, then um, maybe RV, RV, so it's a near field, as you can see there, that's a near field channel, and that's the atrial channel there, and that's the near field channel, the RV, which, so this, this is basically what we saw here. This is basically what we saw here. The connection issue, which is the EGM that they're showing here, so it's affecting the ventricular lead, which is also affecting the um, RV shock coil, and we can see a high frequency noise here, um, so that quite high amplitude as well. On that, that's the same. There. If if we went through the whole thing, it would take a long time. So I'm just trying to go through. Unless while I'm going through it, AJ or Jared, if you see anything that you think is worth.
talking about, just stop me and then we'll, we'll basically go over that. Um, just one thing that I guess is that I think we've spoken about this in the past with AJ when he's gone through, uh, especially with Abbott, looking at noise discriminators and things like that is that we've always got to remember that if it's a genuine ventricular VTVF episode, then you're going to see it on the near field and the far field EGM. Um, I mean, that can be noise, don't get me wrong. But usually if you're seeing something on the far field, but maybe not the near field EGM, then it's probably non-physiological and the device will discriminate against that. So remember just you've always got to see for a device to deliver to think it is a true event that it's got to see it on both the near field and the far field channel and something that i know certainly Abbott devices which aj would know a lot more about do really well and um, so it's just something to look out for that yeah if you're seeing seeing noise uh, only on a single channel then it's uh, hopefully will be well detected by the devices as a as noise as opposed to a uh, ventricular arrhythmia Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah, uh, to what Jared and Julius are saying there too, just to, to give you some more clarification, I'm, I assume a lot of you know, but when we talk about far field, we're talking about the antenna being from the tip of the lead or the coil of the lead, uh, which is more near the RV apex, RV septum, or the you know inferior part of the RV all the way up to the can, which is up in the chest. Um, so that's your anode is the can itself. And you use that for sensing that can pick up a lot of myopotentials. So that could be some of your noise issues. Um, it's just a larger antenna in general. So whenever we're talking about a unipolar, we're just talking about a very large antenna and it can pick up a lot of um, a lot of different signals. And that's why it can be a little problematic and confusing. Just because you see noise on the far field, if the device isn't reacting to it, it's not necessarily you know a bad thing just because far field in nature will pick up more external noise or more myopotential it's more is the device seeing it on the near field is it possibly trying to give therapy to noise that is when it becomes problematic excellent yeah thank you for that um aj and jara yeah for the device if he sees like a true vt for instance if it's picking up and sensing true vt then you'll clearly see it in the rv channel and also on the shock channel um so that's how it is but if he sees an isolated um, um, it senses it will senses things in uh, on the um, on the near field on the RV channel. Then um, the device discriminator will try and discriminate. Look, it will compare it to the far field, like Jared was saying, and that's how the algorithm with discriminators um, for work for ICDs. And they are different, you know, obviously for Abbott and metronic and, and boston they've all got slightly different discrimination algorithm which you can you can learn more about if you want um but yeah it compares the far field to the near field and and that's how it does its discrimination the way it does it the algorithm metronic for instance compares the sizes of the amplitude of the noise and looks for the lowest ones and compares the sizes and the, uh, um, the frequency of them um, and it looks like a, for a ruling 12 cycles and takes an average and compares it. If it's, if it's less than one millivolt, then um, it, it will basically discard it as far as it's over. Then um, then looks at it in detail and, and, and things. If you, if you want to know the algorithm properly, then you can go to the Medtronic Academy, um, which, which will explain all the discrimination algorithm for RV lead noise, um, which is important for prevented inappropriate therapy um, if you've got an ICD. Um, inappropriate therapy um, for noise is, is quite, it's is, is fairly high, not as high as your um, inappropriate therapy for SVTs, but it is, is it does happen um, and with um, ICD patients. So it, it is quite good to always have it programmed on your, or your RV lead noise. I think Jared went through it uh, quite a while back Again, that um, the Medtronic one is set to run about 45 um, seconds um, and it will basically um, shock if the noise continues for more than 45 seconds, which is very rarely happens, <laughs> very rarely happens for that um, to go on um, for that period and that. So, because um, it tries to prevent things that if it's sensing some, some, something for that long, then it must be like an intrinsic arrhythmia. So it's a safety thing that it shocks and that. So Medtronic have their nominal settings at uh, 45 seconds um, that you um, put it on. But some people actually have it off um, 
um, but it depends on your department protocol, what, what you want to um, do. And that is a good thing to have on, in my opinion, though. I'm going through it. If anybody um, has anything, I've I've actually I've actually seen this before, um, where the DF DF one um, shock lead um, has been put like an SVC um, is being put in a, like an RV DF one um, RV is being put into the SVC, and you get this really odd, like really odd um, shock channel. Um, so this is something that when you come across, if it looks, if it doesn't look right, then have be really suspicious. If something doesn't look right, be highly, really, really suspicious. Um, and I've seen this before. Um, yeah, it looks like if you looked at that actual EGM, it's picking up the atrial signal quite a bit more. Yeah, um, yeah, so you sure. can see it corresponds with the atrial sensed event on the far field channel. And then it's also picking up the RV event as well, but it's a smaller amplitude because the SVC coil is sitting up near the atrium or SVC. Um, so that's why you're getting a lot more atrial activity, just to clarify what you're seeing in there. Yeah, fantastic, AJ. That's good. Right. So there are some examples of some lead issues um, here. Um, so... This is this would be your um I'm assuming this would be your short coil and this is a near field um and it's sensing it there. You can see how it's over sensing in, in the VF zone, and you can see V sense VF, 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 VF there, uh, and that. So this is this is clearly noise, high frequency variable, um, like amplitude. I'm sorry, yeah, variable amplitude there, um, very high amplitude. Um, and very intermittent and that. So th this is probably a conductor, it's, they've said a conductor fracture there. Um, so this is typical of a conductor fracture where you, you see um, very high, like variable um, amplitude um, and very high frequency as well. And it's quite like unpredictable on the EGM, it's just quite sporadic. Um, and things. So this is something that you should highly be suspicious of a of a of a conductor fracture, leaf fracture. Um, again, so this this is the conductor fracture. So this is a V pacing, V pacing. My I I, I think it's a safety pace in there. It's a safety piece in there's a noise. Um safety piece in there. So Elvis, Elvis was asking about safety pacing. Um is is that is that um a question there, AJ? Yeah, it looks like are the advantages to DF4 to the DF1 lead. So yeah, DF4 is the standard lead now. Uh DF1 is um was the original form and it was more it's was complicated to put both the sense pace and then the coil rv coil and svc coil all on one um, plug or one uh one tip of the lead to plug into the device so it was it was trifurcated for the longest time or bifurcated in leads that don't have an svc coil uh, the only time that i would intentionally ever do a df1 nowadays um, one is it depends if that's all you have on shelf stock then obviously use the df1 because it functions just fine um, it just has more pocket bulk and there's just a little bit more leads so you have more likely to have lead the lead or lead to can abrasion with a df1 because there's just more there in the pocket um the only time i would typically use one is say you have a dependent patient who is upgraded from a pacemaker and they have a stable uh, rv lead we have in some cases used a df1 lead and plugged the stable rv lead into the sense pace port of the can and then um, just capped the sense pace of the rv lead uh, so the reason being um, you know, if if the patient's dependent or um, in the in the lead micro dislodges, there is a chance that they may not receive pacing. There's also, um, you know, with a stable lead, there's less likely to have a micro displacement of the lead and they get shocked due to noise um, because the lead is no longer, you know, stable in place. So that would be the only time I'd use a DF1 unless I that's all I had on hand. If not, I always would recommend a DF4. I don't know, Jared, Julius, if you see anything different. 
Yeah, I think spot on, spot on, AJ. I think there's only the only few centers in the UK that still implant DF1s. And one of them is Aberdeen, where, where I trained. Um, and for exactly the reason that you've explained, they, they seem to think that um, it just gives them more options because they also do a lot of um, congenital patients who come back. Um, um, we had an electrically isolated patient, you know, electrically um, patient with an electrically electrical heart isolation. So the RV was separated from the LV because um, I think the RV was causing a lot of RVOT um, problems and, and it was isolated. So what they found was that because it was a DF1, it gave them so many different options, whereas a DF4 would not have given them that option. And it had a CR, it had a, it had a, a bivent system as well. So they had so many options because of the electrical isolation of the heart. Um, so for that, but the potential risk of that is that um, because there's so many leads in the pocket that you could um, have like an infection risk um, and things. And and um, so things like that. So really, really value point. Um, I'm just looking at this EGM. So I think the devices detected noise and actually started ATP on here and started to actually um, offer therapy. So this is an inappropriate therapy because of the lead fracture, conductor fracture there. Um, and that's so it's not safety pacing, it's just offering therapy there. So you can see V pacing, um, 315 uh, millisecond cycle. Um, so I'm not sure how many beats, but let's have somebody work it out. 180, 190. Oh, there you go. There's the EP guy. There you go. <laughs> All right. So thanks, Jared. I, I mean, yeah. No, it was AJ, not me, mate. <laughs> oh, sorry. oh, sorry, AJ. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, you're good. I, I was just pulling that off the top of my head. So it's well, 190. So yeah, you're, you're, back. Um, yeah, you're back on. Yeah. And then you see here um, after that, the device does the ATP and then it's waiting to see if there's any intrinsic activity to see if it needs to give more therapy. Well, there's more lead noise and the device is withholding pacing during this period. So this patient all of a sudden has, I don't know how long that is, maybe 30 beats a minute. 300, 150, 175, yeah, 60, 50, 30. Yeah, less than that. Yeah, exactly. So this patient's not receiving any kind of uh, backup pacing. And luckily they have an escape yeah. that occurs, but um, it's not that's ideal. That's a really good point, actually. Yeah, um, AJ, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so that, that's what you get with Oversense and that it inhibits pacing there. And luckily you get this guy, I've had intrinsic beer that came through in the end. Um, so that, that's that's quite an important point. Yeah, thanks for that, yeah. both of you guys. Yeah. Just, just Elos, can I can I say something? Yeah, go for yes, it. Sir. Yeah, the issue of the advantages of DF one of as a DF four lead over DF one leads. All the points are well valid, uh, but the issue here is that uh, you know the sub saharan Africa, we don't even. Uh, uh, we don't even have enough DF4. Most of the people that go uh, and request for uh, request for ICD, they end up getting a DF1 lead. So as you said, DF4 is easier to implant. It's just only one pocket. You don't you don't have confusion because in DF1. You either have two, uh, uh, two pocket. Uh, maybe you, if, as AJ said, if there is no uh, SVC coin, you look for either. Uh, you have uh, you have two arms to plug, so it may be confusing. But in DF one, there is no confusion. Is you just put it in one pocket. Then also uh, the pocket bulkiness uh, is 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 more with DF one compared to the DF4. Uh, as you said, you know you are of a richer society. US and UK are rich society. Africa is not, or the country in the South Sahara Africa are not rich societies. So DF1 is still welcome in our environment, sir. Fantastic. Thanks, Dr. Adafi. That's, pre that's brilliant. Um, you take what you get. Yeah. Sorry, that's, that's, no, no, sorry, man. And that's a very valid point that Dr. Duffy makes is that, yeah, yeah, we might be privileged in the UK and the US and, you know, other countries like that where we can put in these kind of newer model DF4s. But I mean, as, as nice as they are cosmetically and, um, 
you know, the engineering behind all these leads. It's, it's fantastic. Yes. But, um, you, you know, back in the day, I've been fortunate. I've been around long enough where I've kind of been involved with both kind of manufacturing DF1 and DF4. And, you know, back in the day, if you had an issue with a DF1 lead, perhaps the pay sent lead, then you could get away with almost the opposite of what AJ was saying is where you could keep the pay sense lead in and then put in a DF4 and plug in the the um, just the coils into the new box. But on the flip side, if you had an issue with a DF1 lead on the pay sense component of it, which is why, you know, the eyes are the pacemaker, then you could get away with just putting in a new pay sense lead. It's less bulky. Um, so you know, and that's not a bad thing. Is where this day and age, if you're putting a DF4 lead down, then you know they're a little bit, little bit bulkier. So if you can't extract the DF4 lead, then you're going to end up with maybe two DF4 leads in, which is even bulkier. So yeah. you know, there, there's this balance that you've got to kind of come up with, and um, you know, and there's arguments to both. Um, I think as soon as you, it's probably I'm not sure if you're going to get onto it, uh, Julius, but no. One thing that we haven't touched on just yet is is that when you are maybe inserting extra leads in the say the right ventricle, then you're at risk of a, a noise called knocking, where the two leads can knock against each other. Um, I haven't seen it a lot, but I've certainly seen it once or twice, where you might have to put in two leads in the ventricle, and they and you know one of the leads is is defunct, not working, but it may knock against the other lead and cause uh, inappropriate noise. So again, it's just another another thing to deal with. So. Yeah, in my opinion, there's pros and cons to both. Um, yeah. But you've just got to, again, be open-minded to it all. Spot on. Spot, spot on, Jared. Actually, that, that is one of the reasons why they still carry on in using it in Aberdeen. In fact, they won't have anyone change their mind. Um, it's one of the f- few places. Um, but having said that, I was thinking about that recently. I th- oh, 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 this has been recorded, actually. I, should, I shouldn't say that. Um, but I, I think I, I think I, I, I think I've changed my mind. I think I'm going for a DF4 now because we do that quite a lot in Northampton. And um, but the, 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 obviously the, the 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 benefit of having a DF1 is that if something were to go wrong with the patient's um, port um, or, or or the patient's port or the defibrillation port, then you've got an option of maybe capping it and then putting an entirely new lead in. Whereas if your if something were to go wrong on a DF4, then you have to and take the whole entire thing or leave it and then tap it and then put an entire lead um, in. So you have more options. You have more options with your DF4 than you would do with your uh, with your DF1 than you would do with your DF4. So, yeah, and that's it. And I certainly, in my opinion, I would not look at the DF1 as an as an inferior lead. I wouldn't go, oh my god, you've got an a DF1 lead versus a DF4. I think. I think they both, at the end of the day, they both offer the same thing. Um, I think really just these days, it's cosmetically, you can produce a smaller can. Um, there's a few extra connectors that have to go into the device. There's, in theory, a few extra less issues. So, but I certainly wouldn't see one as uh, superior to the other, personally. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so that 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 you were talking about abandoned lead and another lead being implanted, so that can increase like a crosstalk where it will oversense and um, like Gerard was saying, crosstalk can obviously when it oversenses on on the actual um, um, RV lead can obviously um, cause pacing inhibition or, or withhold tachy, um, where in fact inappropriately treat um, an oversense um, 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 rhythm and end up like giving a patient an inappropriate shock and that. So you can get that with an abandoned lead um, next, you can cause crosstalk um, with that. Um, so that's called crosstalk as well. So I think, I'm not sure, E.J. Hamid, but I think, oh, sorry. Comment from Mohammed there, I think, about electrical showers. Um, I think it was a question whether he was asking whether we've seen uh, any inappropriate shocks through electrical showers. And I certainly have here in the UK, um, where, you know, a bit of a, a cowboy electrician hasn't plumbed in the uh, the shower properly and maybe left, um, you know, leaking current and things like that. So, I've, yeah, I've definitely seen a patient who's presented before uh, who have had multiple shocks after having showers. Um, and, yeah, again, as I said before, through you put your investigation hat on, you, uh, you kind of work out going, right, well, there's a common theme here that every time this guy has a shower, 
he seems to be getting a lot of inappropriate noise. And yeah, we've certainly isolated one or two cases to uh, poorly wired electrical showers. So I hope yeah. that helps. Did you go to the patient's home and test it out or how did you get to the bottom? Of it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> that's, that's a really good one. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I've seen that. Um, yeah. So a, a big thing is, you know, not being grounded too. So yeah, as, as uh, Jared pointed out, um, you know, grounding is, is a big issue. And will you see that in, um, I've seen it in a, in an implant procedure where they had an LED light to make up for lack of lighting in the room and they didn't properly ground it and it was causing noise in the device. Um, so grounding is a big issue. If you're having issues, you know, with, with anything in a procedure, you can try turning things off. Obviously nothing that they need to sustain their, their, uh, their life ongoing, but anything that doesn't seem necessary, try flipping it off. And that may be your, your culprit. Yeah. Fantastic guys. Fantastic. So this is another good good thing to look at when somebody comes in with a conductor fracture. With conduct, conductor fracture, obviously you're going to be getting a really high impedance. So look at the trend, the impedance trend. And you can see here, it's a really good example here. The impedance normally is fluctuating between 700 ohms to 940. You get a spike there. Um, but then from about June 2010, you get all this really high impedance, like all of a sudden abrupt, dramatic change in impedance, up and down, up and down, and that that should arouse your suspicion that something definitely is wrong. And and obviously, you might, the EGM might suggest that as well. Um, um, and that so the shock impedance is fine, is within normal range, so that's good. Um, and that so sometimes it's always good. It's always good to look at. The, the 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 ventricular um obviously the ventricular egm look at the sense and intrinsic amplitude as well if you have the trend if there's any sporadic like behavior patterns um with that and also look at the shock impedance as well um if there's any you know sporadic behavior you can always isolate it if you do have like a trend it's always good to have the, the trend um enabled so you can actually see um a pattern over six months or a year and really really helpful when you're trying to make trying to make diagnosis if something is wrong so i, I would definitely encourage that um certainly um right i'm not sure how much time i have um i know this is is quite a lot um aj because i know you've i don't know how much it's seven o'clock <laughs> seven o'clock already yeah. Um, no, I think that's good. Uh, if we have any other questions, we can, you know, feel free to reach out in the chat or reach out to us directly. Um, I think these are fantastic. So I think you set these slides out. So please just look through it on your own. And these are some really good examples. You can see there is a conductor, uh, looks like insulation breach. Um, insulation breaches, you'll see drop in impedance suddenly or over time. Um, conductor fractures, you'll see sudden jumps in impedance. And remember, just think of it like a hose. If there's a hole in your hose, uh, then the water is escaping outside. So you have a drop in impedance. If your hose is kinked, then you uh, the water won't flow. So you have a higher impedance. Uh, slow rise in impedance is an indicator of uh, lead mineralization or things like that at the tissue interface. It could also be um, scar onset from MI, anything like that. Um, so if you see slow changes in impedance, that's something else uh, rises in impedance that that can indicate something other than a lead issue can still be a lead issue. But yeah, also remember sometimes like like EJ have just said, if if you have like a, a previous MI and um, there's, a, there's an impedance chain that can also associate with um, a high threshold as well. Um, even to the point of even exit block where it won't it won't capture um and things. So always be in mind. Um that's one thing to has there been an MI. So you can get like a threshold rises if there's been like um um like an MI in the past. You, you think why is that threshold just jumped up all of a sudden? Or that can also affect the impedance. There's been some previous MI that's called some scar tissue mm. around the area where you have a, a device um a myocardium interface. Um, and things yeah oh, that's, that's, a really, a, that's a really that's a really good point yeah um what, what question can you see direct can you see insulation breach on flasco you can in this case um you can't always and sometimes the insulation breach may be where the leads are actually touching one another um where you end up having this abrasion that you might not even see it 
um, I've seen noise on an RV lead because the atrial insulation was breached and they were touching each other and you were getting noise on the atrial channel. And it was just because the amount of insulation between the two of them was halved essentially because the RV lead still had integrity, but the RA didn't. Um, so usually if you see noise on the lead, that is the culprit, but it's not always the case. Um, like I said, if there's damage to the pocket, uh, the lead in the pocket, there's opportunities to repair that lead with a re lead repair kit or use um, a suture sleeve and try to repair the lead in um, in the procedure itself without having to replace it if you can. Um, we had, looks like Dr. Uh, Dr. Jellian uh, said he wanted to pass on his regards to the Northampton folks, Dominic Cox, David Springs, and Patrick Davey. So uh, okay. if, you, if you talk to them, Julius, please yeah. uh, give them a shout out. Brilliant, I will, I definitely will, yeah. Perfect. Um, um, I, I think, do you sorry, want to I was just gonna, it? yeah, go on. I was gonna say, um, I think we're at the end here is, um, so like obviously EMI, electrocautery, um, drawing by procedure, peri procedure, things like this is a type of typical pattern that you see, and you see it on um, all channels. Um, that's a really, really good one. Um, I think AG went through um, a while ago about electrocautery. Um, what if you can't if you can't contact if the patient is dependent, then obviously you need to place a magnet on on um, or put the um, the device in a synchronous spacing. Um, he went over that a while, a while ago. Um, so this is MRI. This is what MRI looks like on an EGM. Look at this, and it's a high frequency, and it's is modulated. Saying so, mm -hmm. um, it's quite continuous signal, periodic, and this is certainly what it looks like for MRI signal. Um, a tens, um, Jarad mission about tens. This is what tens look like. This actually does look like that. I've seen it a few times, mm -hmm. and when people do use it, so this is what it looks like. Um, that's a high frequency, low and constant up amplitude, which is quite common. A lot of people do use tens uh, machines at home and things. Um, so this is an um, anti-surveillance um, monitoring system, anti-theft detection system, which we have a lot. Um, I think nowadays in most supermarkets. Um, so the, the, this is what it can do. I always tell patients not to stand underneath it and have a chit chat with a security guard. Just, <laughs> just, walk, just walk through it as you would do normally. Um, and that, so that has a potential source of EMI interference as well. And there's so many, so many telemetry, mm. so many motorbike. This is where motorbike engine mm -hmm. looks like. Um, so um, you, you might come across this. Um, yeah. And that, so this is always refer. So this is yours. This is from Boston Educare. So keep that in your clinics and always refer back to this. If you've got a patient who is showing um, some of this um, um, EGM, um, potential EMI um, um, over sensing, um, so you can so you can pinpoint to where exactly what it is, and like um, Jared was saying, there's a lot of investigation. You really need to ask them a lot of questions um, and things. So it's really important to refer back to this. It's a 50 hertz main frequency. This is this is what it looks like, um, an EGM, um, <clears throat> the power line. This is what a power line looks like as well. Um, so this is something that you could easily see in, in, in Nigeria as well or anywhere in Africa. So I, li I like this, this summary here. It says noise checker, physiological or non-physiological. Um, so think about time of implant, where, where it is in the patient system, um, amplitude of, and frequency. Is it high amplitude, low frequency, high frequency, low amplitude? Um, is it intermittent or is it um, repeatable? continuous um lead fractures you know it's quite it's quite um sporadic like high amplitude um you know that's typical of um lead fracture and, and things like that so typically if you get somebody if you suspect it um you, you can't also go for an x-ray we you know some um there was a there was a metronic device actually um which um the conductor coil um become externalized and and the impedance um doesn't actually show that it's quite you, you might get like a sporadic hike in the impedance but any other time when you do the impedance measurement is fine but that is only revealed when you do 
you can say x-ray or even you do an angiogram sometimes you might have to do an angiogram because a conductor might actually if it comes out from from the insulation body it will be revealed more in an angiogram and that so don't forget that you can also use an angiogram sometimes to help if you think there's a um, some kind of fault with the lead um it might it might help it might help, but your typical, we do x-ray, do all the isometric provocation measurements um, and things to try and, um, you know, delineate what where, where the fault is and things. Um, so I think that's really it. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, sorry to, to cut you off just because we only have about 20 minutes left. Uh, maybe jump over to the LV lead talk and then we can just save the uh, quiz for next week if that works for everybody. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that is fine. Okay, uh, but perfect. I, that is fine. Can I, can I have a question, um, uh, Julius and uh, AJ. Uh, the question is this. The, the case we had uh, today is um, a 92-year-old uh, man who had uh, a complete heart block, symptomatic. The heart rate uh, falls between 25 to 30. And uh, the same patient also had... Uh, did, did we lose you, Dr. Daffy? I think we have. Yeah. Can you hear me? We got yeah. you back. So, yeah. So the the he had an, an advanced less uh, left breast CA. Yeah. 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 Looks like we might have lost you again, sir. So, uh, in the meantime, while we wait for Dr. Daffy to get back, I wanted to thank Julius. Uh, that was. A fantastic presentation. We really appreciate you going through that with us. Um, it, it's really, it's great to see these these firsthand examples, and I'm glad that uh, our friends in Boston were able to provide us this uh, this educational talk. So, um, if you have any questions, reach out to any of us to to talk you through it and help out. Like I said, noise is not an issue until it's an issue, and then it can become a big one. So, uh, just let us know how we can help. Can uh, everybody see my screen? Yeah, my loud and clear. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So really quickly, uh, we, next week we have Dr. Uh, Sharif and Dr. Kuro doing their talk on LV lead placement. So we think that it might just be good to look at the different LV leads available that you'll most likely see. Uh, this is not going to be comprehensive. It's going to focus on Abbott and Medtronic, and then also some of the LV lead delivery tools. So um, when we talk about our left ventricular lead, remember that we're getting access to the coronary sinus. So it's actually in the right atrium. It's following the CS up and around, and then we're going for a, uh, a lateral, posterior lateral uh, position um, generally. So the original LV leads were unipolar. So they only had one electrode, and then it, was, it would either go to the can or usually to the other lead. Um, this did cause issues with anodal stem, and still can be an issue, but just to be aware, an otal stem is where you're actually capturing at the side of the anode and not necessarily capturing at the side of the cathode, leading to either simultaneous RV LV pacing or uh, non capturing the LV and just think you are, which is not ideal. So the original were unipolar only. Later iterations offered bipolar uh, options where you could actually go tip to ring or ring to tip. Uh, these are still manufactured, but they're not as common. You don't see them as often uh, implanted. Sometimes implanters will use them because they're a little smaller, um, but the French size difference is really not um, impactful enough to sacrifice not having your four electrodes. So the quadrupolar lead came out in the early to mid to uh, 2000s, 2010s. Um, so it's been around for about 10 years or more, um, and it allows you to pace from multiple sites, either to go to the coil, uh, to the can, or bipolar options as well. Just remember that anodal stem is, is a potential risk. So if we're looking at the Abbott leads, you have the quartet. Um, we tend not to use this one as much. This is actually um, was made for people who are very used to the Medtronic um, design. So it was kind of a way to uh, for them to use the, the design they're used to, but using an Abbott device. Uh, the typical is this S-curve here. So your 1458 is your standard. Your 1456 is um, going to be a tighter 
a little bit tighter of a curve and the spacing is not quite as much. So you're looking at 47 um, millimeters of spacing from tip to prox, 40 from tip to prox, and then your 1458 QL will give you 60 uh, millimeters of spacing from tip to prox. Uh, the reason with proximal, just to con uh, the reason being, say, if you're in the um, left ventricle and you're near the apex, you may want to have a more basal electrode positioning. If you had the shorter spacing, you may not be basal enough. You'll be more apical. Um, on the inverse, if you're in a very shallow branch, if you have the wider spacing, your proximal electrode could be outside into the main body of the CS and essentially useless. So if you have the ability to pick the right lead, it gives you some customizability based on whatever branch you're going for. Um, Medtronic, the uh, attain has a they have an attain stability lead that actually has an active fixation ability. So you see here, you actually have the ability to twist it and it will snag itself into the um, into the CS. This can lend to extra stability. So that you may come across this as well. Um, and Julius, uh, Jared, or anyone who's a Medtronic expert, feel free to jump in because these are not my wheelhouse. But I just know a little bit about them, so I will not. Uh, I greatly appreciate any kind of consideration sorry. you have. Sorry, AJ. I was going to say really quickly, um, the slide before where you have mm -hmm. the active fixation of Medtronic, I know they tend to use it really um, if, if, the, if the vessel is really large and you want some stability, like you've said, to try and um, fix it to um, like the wall, then, then they tend to go for that. But for any, for if the, if the vessel, if the branches smaller then they don't tend to go for that with this one they tend to go for your typical either straight tine or maybe the s-shaped one depending on um, the shape of the branch um but yeah i've seen this obviously being used a lot if the branch is quite wide and mm -hmm. so to give it a, some more stability they might use that and i think i think dr daffy's used this a few times as well when we've been there um to nigeria last last year okay yeah all right I've correct Perfect. And then here's uh, an example of the one without the fixation. This actually looks like it has like a passive fixation ability to it. If you see their spacing, um, you know, people have different opinions on how viable, you know, a smaller spacing is as far as giving you options within the, you know, across the heart, but it does, um, you know, reduce the risk of having um, and that um, diaphragmatic stem because you're having a smaller antenna or a smaller separation, you're less likely to engage um, extra cardiac tissue. So I think that is one of the reasons why they went with the shorter spacing. Um, so yeah. Then we have delivery options. So you have your outer catheters. Uh, here's the Abbott delivery options, CPS AIM Universal. They also have an SL2, which is a smaller French size, but typically we use the universal because you can deliver a quartet lead through the inner dilator. It says 9.90 French. Um, on the box, it's 10.06 French. So either way, it will fit through a 10 French uh, sheath for um, for delivery. So don't worry about that. You just want to, if you want to use a 10 French outer sheath, um, that is more than capable. Um, inner diameter is eight French. So anything that you put through there, eight French will, will work fine. Um, and then standard length is 47 centimeters. They also have a 54 for a little bit longer length. As far as, um, you know, designs or curves. Once again, they'll talk about this in greater detail, but you have your wides and your extra wides for those very dilated hearts. You have your 115s and 135s for more standard hearts. I think 135 is going to be called like the Medtronic multi-purpose. Uh, this would be called like the extended hook, um, the extra wide. And then the right side, this just gives you a little bit more push off um, of the atrium or off the SVC area to try to get um, into the CS itself coming from the right side. I know some physicians that actually use the right side from the left, but these are just different options and we can go into more detail when they do the um, LV talk. And then you have your inner catheters as well. So your inner catheters will actually go inside of your outer, which makes sense. And then you can deliver the lead through the inner catheter. So you're looking at a five, five to six French inner diameter. Um, a quartet lead is what? 4.7 French lead body, 5.1 French, the widest electrode. So it'll fit through there, no worries. Uh, the reason why we have these is for subselecting veins or getting CS access. So your CSL and your AL2 are both used to get access to the CS. And then for subselecting certain veins as you're trying to navigate the, the uh, 
the different uh, veins within the CS is the inner here. So you can see an acute will give you a more acute turn, um, 90, and then you're obtuse. Keep in mind, the acute tends to be 90 when you put a lead and a wire in it. The 90 tends to be more obtuse and the obtuse tends to be pretty straight. So um, I use 90 and acute most of the time. I rarely use an obtuse. To see them all kind of working together, you have your valve bypass tool, which is just one of the accessories to get the lead through there. It's also a way to get the um, inner through the through the valve without causing damage to the, uh, without crimping the end, which can cause delivery issues. You see here, you're running an outer catheter that's been straightened out because of the inner catheter that's a 90, and then lead and wire is actually inside of that lead as well. So that's how they all kind of work together in a telescoping fashion so that you can kind of navigate. So you have the Medtronic delivery systems, very similar as you can see, you have your uh, AL2 styles, you have your extended hooks, you have um, your more acute bends. This is probably a right-sided. So um, there's a lot of different options out there to navigate the CS and to uh, implant the leads. There is also, uh, looks like Medtronic, here's their inners. Um, once again, very similar um, in design and they all kind of do the same thing, but physicians have different preferences or sometimes you just kind of work with whatever's on the shelf. Medtronic also makes a steerable. I don't know if you'll ever come across these, but they have a, a deflectable catheter as well that can help you uh, navigate in the CS. Um, and then the Whirly system, I believe Dr. Kuro, she said she uses the Whirly. Um, it's pretty popular. Um, and this is, I think uh, Merit distributes them, but um, they are a, it's a system developed by a physician. It's a peelable system. Um, so there's slittables and there's peelables. Anytime you deliver an LV lead, you're going to need to get that sheath out of the body or the catheter out of the body. So you're going to either have to slit it or peel it. Um, it's not going to be like the, the solid sheaths that you use uh, for groin access in coronary. Um, Worley intercatheters, that's their, their vein selectors that they have available. Um, and once again, we can do a deeper talk here just for time. I want to make sure we cover all of this occlusion balloons. So anytime that you're shooting dye, um, you'll need to, um, or you don't need to, but if you want to really see the CS and see it light up, you may occlude the CS with the balloon, shoot dye, kind of like what you do um, in the cath lab, but we're looking at the venous structures as well. Um, you can obviously, you can honestly see a lot of like backfill and kind of see where your target branches are going to be. Finally, um, there are different wires available. So you have like an 014 whisper wire that goes inside the lead. 035 wires will not fit inside the lead, but they're good. Or 038s are good for just trying to get it into a branch of the CS or get it in the CS itself and then telescope your inner and outer catheters over it. Uh, Trumo glide, glide wires are not going to be the metal. They're a, like a polyurethane jacketed wire. They work very well as, also. And then finally, you can use different EP catheters. So uh, CSL is very common. We use at Mass General um, Hospital. Uh, there's very there's a lot of options with that. There's also a live wire, which is a deflectable. Once again, I'm not sure how often you get to have your hands on these, but they're all options to try to get inside the CS itself. The benefit of using an EP catheter is they're a little more stiff than your um, than your wires. So you may be able to get it where it needs to go, load your delivery sheets over it, pull the the uh, EP catheter out and go in with the lead, um, which is all different techniques that will be covered on the future talk. Finally, you have your slitters. Uh, this is the Med or this is the Abbott uh, Universal Slitter. There's a new one coming out that has a little bit different design, but it's going to be pretty similar to this. Um, it you'll actually lock the lead into the plastic channel and put your thumb over it to cover it up, and then angle is very important. You want to make sure that this line here lines up with the catheter um itself with the with the valve itself so we usually just kind of work our way past the valve very slowly wedging it back and forth until we get to about here and then it's one solid slitting motion same thing with the medtronics this is their um their uh their different adjustable slitters that they have they're universal and they're adjustable just remember when you're slitting just to keep going um, if you stop and pause and take a look, you can the lead can become unseated, it can get caught, and the whole system could pull back. So the best thing is just get your way past the valve, make sure that you're lined up, you're on plane, and then one solid motion. Uh, as you pull to slit, you want to pull like you're starting a lawnmower. You don't want to pull into your chest because if you run out of room, 
you pause and then the whole thing could uh, get caught and you got to start all over. And after a long procedure, it's exhausting. Um, and then finally, uh, this stuff here, I haven't had a chance to really organize it, uh, but Julia shared it with me, but it's different uh, resources as far as headers and um, other options. So we can share that with you later on. Uh, any questions for me? I know I run through that very, very quickly. So we can go back and review anything. If you have any questions, um, you can also reach out directly. But uh, anybody have anything, anything in the chat? No, <clears throat> that, that was perfect. <laughs> that was really good. Um, I was going to see that Wally kit. Um, Dr. Daffy um, you, has used one before, One, I think one. Yeah, you are right. And you really liked very it, nice. didn't you? Yes, very nice. <laughs> We had we had some experience with it, AJ. Very nice. Nice. Yeah. The question I was asking them before I log out, and my network logged me out, mm -hmm. was uh, the patient uh, with V today is 90, 92 years old, and um, he had a symptomatic uh, um, complete heart block, and also had a left uh, breast C with metastasis to the axillary as of now, then it may be more than that. So the issue was that the pulse rate was between 25 and 30. So the, the surgical team refused to take the case, uh, insisting that until the pulse is corrected, the case will not be taken. So I had a meeting with the surgical team and uh, they want to do um, a modified um, um, radical uh, mastectomy for the patient. So what uh, I now ask them, okay, this is uh, traditionally, I take the left, uh, below the left clavicle. So now you are going to do a modified uh, radical mastectomy. Of what extent? So the question is that they said no, uh, no, they, they don't know the extent yet because uh, they would take as much of that tumor as they can go. And also, they are also going to use a diatomy. So uh, we now decided that we should uh, take the, uh, the device from the right so that we avoid any close by um, uh, contact of uh, their procedure and the device. So mm -hmm. that was why we went and took that device from the from the right. So the mm -hmm. device has already come in, has been implanted, a dual chamber pacemaker, uh, the, the, uh, the patient is doing great. So with the next point is uh, when they are going to take the, uh, the mastectomy, because the mastectomy will stem the whole of that left breast we go and extend it down into uh, more much of the subcutaneous skin above and below and extending it into the axilla and take much and debulk as much as possible. And also being that the man is uh, already 92, uh, the surgical team and the oncology team, they are thinking that they don't want to go into a uh, chemotherapy. I left that option for them because is an, it's the option of an oncology team. Uh, they are the expert in it, so whatever. So the question, AJ, is this. Um, the, the, during Julius' presentation, he talked about the issue of, um, of, um, uh, of, um, of diatomy, uh, having um, the device keeping up sensing all this. So what do you advise? Uh, what advice do you think? because we are still going to meet within the week talking about this case, what advice you think we should offer uh, or we should uh, add to already existing uh, um, pattern of the teamwork? Hmm. Um, I, so, you know, I, it sounds like you already, you, you spoke about going you know, right-sided. I, I think that Let's have a conversation offline on this one because I'm not. I'd like to see the case a little better and and talk through it with you, if you don't mind. And then we can present okay. to the group, to the larger group, what we've discussed. I guess if that works. Um, 
and then we just post what we what we thought to the rest of the group once we've talked it out yeah the 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 no diatomy has um a before now uh the there are bipolar diatomy there are unipolar diatomy so uh, bipolar diatomy are better in terms of uh, electrical sensations mm -hmm. uh, in terms of electrical sensation because this is a patient who is uh, who had a complete heart block and when the pacemaker came in the patient is now pacemaker dependent mm -hmm. the heart rate as at the time the fv lead was implanted was around 20 so uh, automatically that patient doesn't have a good underlying reading to mm. maintain uh, its uh, to maintain himself mm. so the issue here is that if we are if we use um, if we are so liberal with diatomy or we use unipolar diatomy where mm. the, uh, the 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 device now senses that the heart is picking up sorry, is firing his own device, not knowing that he senses something different, that will bring, bring a problem during the surgery. So I told them that uh, the least we can go with is, um, is a bipolar diet, uh, diatomy. Uh, the, because they need that diatomy to maintain that level of surgery and also uh, maintain bleeding because they need it to um, uh, to coagulate the vessels as you cut through in the process of the surgery. So mm. that is one of the main issues. Then two, I also left that site because I don't, um, as we're discussing, even they themselves don't know the extent. Go when you are implanting a device, you implant it maybe about two cm below the clavicle. But this is, uh, they are planning that they are going to take a very chunk of that skin out and they still need to create a flap to close back whatever that remains so that may affect the device uh, so that so totally that area is not a uh, is not an option to implant a device before the uh, the surgery so if mm. we take it in another day i think uh, uh, more options can also be made available maybe Julius and um, and uh, and uh, Jared or any other uh, person. Also, Mo, Dr. Mole is here. Dr. Mole is here. Maybe he must have had one or two experience on the issue of um, um, uh, 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 implanting cardiac device before uh, before um, uh, mastectomy and what form your choice of what part to use. And uh, why do you use that? And what do you advise the surgeon to uh, to do during the? Because the patient would definitely be on on a GA, and no surgeon will give a GA when uh, general anesthesia when the pulse is uh, when the pulse rate is around 20, 25. It's yeah, once that patient come into a GA, that patient will not definitely survive it. So that is one of the reasons for us to get the device. On board. Then after the surgery, what should the cardiologist do? So these are all options that are left for the group to make very good comments so that we can have a very optimal management of this patient. Yep. Doctor, really quickly. Doctor, you, oh, yeah. Sorry, go, you, you go, mate. No, you go. Now, I was gonna I was gonna say, can you not put a temporary wire in, in a patient? Well, am, am I understanding you correctly? That the has a patient got a device already? But the device is no. Big. The patient ever had a device. The patient presented with uh, symptomatic heart block and also advanced left breast CA. The patient mm. ever had any device. You so I had a meeting with the team, uh, with the surgical team, who are now advised that they cannot go ahead with the surgery. So the first thing is to. Uh, deploy a device and correct the uh, the symptomatic complete heart block before they think of taking their surgery. Uh, so, the man is an elderly man, and yeah. um, the, what they yeah. just want to plan for him is modify radical mastectomy yeah. so and Dr. Daffy, follow him up. Dr. Yes. Daffy, what we do, I'm sure that's what Gerard is about to say. So what we do here um, as an adjunct to... Um, mm -hmm. 
a, to to be to, for a patient having a permanent pacemaker system, we can put like a semi-permanent system in um, through the jugular vein. We can do that, um, and that can stay there for for uh, maybe several days to a week or maybe even beyond. Um, or you can put a temporary wire, temporary wire in um, until you know for the surgery. Put a temporary. I'm, I'm sure Jared sent. I don't know if it's been sent already. Some temporary, um, temporary wire boxes. Um, yeah, have I reached Africa yet? Yeah, so that that's on his way to you, and so you'll be able to put a temporary Oops. wire in um, you know, as an adjunct to the procedure. And then once it's finished, then you can mm. think about putting a, te- a permanent system in. So you've got two options: no. a temporary wire. Yeah. The- the I'm, 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 not, I'm not a doctor, by the way. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. You need to ask a doctor this. Yeah, no, 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 that's it. I'm just wondering, doctor. The, the permanent you, system um... is already. Right, doctor Daffy, Jared is trying to say something. All right. No, no, go no. He's more important than I. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jared. <laughs> uh, sorry, gentlemen. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I, I do have to hop off into another call. Um, are okay. we? Are you all right with taking this offline, and then we'll present to the group, uh, like as a case study? Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, sounds great. Sounds Fantastic. Great. Thank, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, Doctor. I don't want to cut that you off. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's chat about it. Let's organize the chat. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Perfect. We'll have, we'll have a conversation on the side, and then we'll get it all figured out. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Sorry to cut you off, Dr. Dafe, but thank you, Jared. Thank you, Julius. Thank you, um, everyone, thank for your you. contribution. <laughs> thank you, everyone. It's, uh, it's been thank great. You, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, great day. Yeah, Dr. Julius, great day.